of those invaders come up to this fortress and live in this fort until help came from the next nearest Spanish community. Only problem was that was Havana, Cuba. It meant they were going to be here for two or three months. So in order to make this possible, all the room on the west side held two to three months worth of military goods as far as food goes. The north side and east side had black powder and other military goods the fort needed to defend itself. The only rooms in the entire fort you ever meant to be lived in are the rooms on the south side. You had anywhere from 15 to 30 soldiers out of a 500 man garrison coming up here. They would man the fort for one or two days, then at the end of that tour of duty, relief crew would come up and these guys would get to go back home and go on to other duties. Because out of our 500 man garrison here, we also staffed two forts to the south, eight to the north, and 14 to the west. So as you can tell, this one garrison covered a big geographic area. Now, the fort is built to sustain that number of people, not only in its storage inside, but also in the environment that was going to have to protect those people. An artillery invasion is going to have to be a very heavily built structure, and it is, but you start off with not the best stone in the world. The stone the fort's made out of is called coquina. It's a local sedimentary shell stone. You can see it exposed in a number of areas here in our walls. It is made up of billions and billions of shells bonded together by nature over a very long period of time into a very porous stone. Uh, as such, when it comes out of the ground, it likes to hold on to that moisture. And that was one of the big problems building this fortress. They'd quarry the stones over on Anastasia Island, bring them across to our workyard where our parking lot is today, and that's when they ran into that problem. They had to set those stones aside and let them dry on average anywhere from two to three years before the stone mason felt they could work on them properly. So you had that problem as one of the biggest obstacles they had to overcome building this fortress. Because there's over 100 million pounds of stone in this fortress. It is almost all in our exterior wall. That wall sits on a foundation course that's 18 feet thick, 4 feet deep, solid stone block. Then the main gallery level, the walls are anywhere from 12 to 17 feet thick, solid stone block. Give you a good idea how thick that is. The rooms around the perimeter are average about 18 feet wide, so the walls are almost as thick as the rooms are wide, all to stop that artillery from getting in this fortress. Then we're further protected by the fact that we're built down inside of a dry moat. What this dry moat is more than anything else, it's a fox all the fort's hiding down inside of it, trying to keep from getting shot at. Uh, best proof of that, you go down to the parking lot, turn around, look back up the hill, you can only see the top third of the wall. And with the glacis actually up to its full height, because it is worn down over the years now, up to its full height, the only part of the fort you can see, very top section where the guns live. They had to be exposed so they could project force out, but also... The elevation of the hill matched maximum depression for the guns upstairs. So anybody coming up that hill is literally coming up in the face of our artillery. Which is going to be a very bad thing because guys, unlike they showed you in the movie The Patriot, where they're firing a single round iron ball at a bunch of guys coming up the hill at them, and what they would actually do in the 18th century and earlier is fire what's called canister, which for the big guns on our south side, one of those canister rounds is almost 2,040 caliber musket balls in it. And since these are smoothbore guns, you can triple shot them. So that's almost 6,000 musket balls in one shot. You get every gun on the same side all firing at the same time, and you've just sandblasted the hill clean of anybody trying to attack this fortress. And just so nobody ever forgot what they were going up against, Spain did something very special. Now you can see there's some plaster remains on the interior here. They knew they were going to have to waterproof the structure so that it would not pick up the moisture. They went ahead and put a white limestone plaster on the whole fortress, but they also added red plaster highlights. You can see some of them over there by our chapel today. Those red plaster highlights with the white background matches the Spanish flag of the time period, when we have flying today. Red cross and a white flag. That way anybody sailing by looks into St. Augustine's Bay, sees a cute little town, cute little harbor, great big hulking white and red fortification immediately knew. Spanish fort, lots of guns, stay away. And it worked. Forts in combat 15 times. Wins all 15 times. But if you take the amount of time she was actually in combat, Add it all up, it comes to about 28 months. And then compare that how time, how long this fort was actively used as military fortification, it comes out to about 265 years. So you got 265 years as an active military fortification, but only 28 months of active combat. Just being here, the threat that this fort implied to anybody who thought about taking St. Augustine, acted as a deterrent to preserve this community. Now, the fort's been modified several times during its career. The biggest one you actually see here, because originally this courtyard used to be 50 feet wider east-west and 50 feet wider north-south. The rooms were originally only 12 feet deep. After the 1702 siege, when the city was burned to the ground, they rebuilt the city, started using what the fort's made out of, Coquina block, and what our floor here is are made out of, local version of concrete called tabia. 
It has no gravel and it has what we have the most of, seashells. So now you have poured concrete homes in town, nice fireproof city. They started building walls around the city, turning into fortification. So they no longer needed this place as their place of refuge. So they decided to change it into a fortified warehouse. 1738, they start ripping the entire interior out of the fortress. Raise the exterior walls from the original 26 foot height to the 33 and a half foot height there today. Pull the rooms further in the courtyard. That takes them from two months to an entire year's worth of food for the community. Stored in our west wall, an entire year's worth of military supplies stored inside this fortress. And then they put the high vaulted arches in that were considered bomb proof at that time period. Thought being if a cannonball or exploding mortar shell hit above, force be translated down through the structure and dissipate in the ground below, protecting the contents of the room. But this also did something else. Originally, the only place they had cannons were the diamond-shaped bastions, one in each one of our corners. Six guns in each bastion, 24 guns altogether. Now with these nice wide avenues around all four sides, supported by heavy stone arches, we can have more guns. Castillo went from 24 guns to almost 60 guns on our top deck, which usually somebody in the back goes ahead and says, so what? And I usually don't tell people. I used to teach high school history so I can hear that. <laughs> and whoever did it becomes the brunt of the rest of my program. But, since nobody volunteered, I saw you, sir. You were thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I said so much good Oh, oh, oh. I, I, mentally, though, I, I caught that. But anyway, what a lot of people don't realize is the guns of that time period are, are capable of a lot more than Hollywood portrays. Worked on three movies and found out one thing real quick. Hollywood lies because they show these big guns throwing balls only a couple hundred yards. Truth of the matter is, the little guns we're going to fire tomorrow, six-pounders, they're upstairs by our bell tower. There's three of them together in battery. I call them small guns. They each weigh 1,200 pounds. But they can throw a six-pound iron ball with three pounds of black powder behind it. And from the top of our fort, hit the lighthouse a mile and a half away. Now, the big guns, you've already seen, they're our south battery. Those guns are 16s, 18s, and 24-pounders. They can throw their respective munitions and hit targets up to three and a half miles downrange. So with almost 60 guns like that around up top, this fortress could defend herself, the city, and all the approaches to the city by land and by water. That's what made her so tough, how she was built and how she was armed. When Florida becomes part of the United States in 1821 by treaty, the U.S. Army comes in, they survey this fortress, and they report back to Washington. There's nothing they can change about this old Spanish fort but its name. And that's what they do, to change it to Fort Mary and it's Francis Mary and Swamp Fox. It serves the United States military from 1821 until 1900, when it's finally demilitarized, maintained on caretaker status by the War Department with the local historical society until 1933 when the Park Service takes over. <laughs> and we take care of it all the way up until today with one little glitch. With the bombing of Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt dissolved the Park Service, and all the rangers that wanted to could go in the military. All the national parks, national battlefields, national monuments <laughs> went back to the Department of War to be utilized in World War II. This 17th century fortification went to war in the 20th century with the United States Coast Guard. They came inside, put radios in our east rooms, used those rooms to coordinate anti-submarine patrols all along the coast of Florida and Georgia right from here. And after World War II, we got our back from taking care of her since through what we call the Long Siege, which, guys, I hate to say is you. The Spanish never intended half a million people a year to come through our fort, but that's what happens now. We do the best we can to keep her up. Oh, pardon me. You know, it's awful. It takes a lot of noise like that to actually wake me up. But <laughs> <laughs> what happens here is we try to do what we can to keep the fort going. You can see some of the repair work that's going on around here. Uh, the